Here we go. Here we go. What's going on, bibliophiles? Welcome back to Poetry and Prejudice. I hope that you are having a fantastic Thursday. And if you aren't, I hope a little poetry makes your day a little better. Today, we are going to be reading a poem by the goat, in my opinion. The Dawn, the literary master. I am, of course, talking about no other than the Polish poet Zbigniew Herbert. We're going to be reading his poem, I Gave My Word. And with that said, let's go ahead and read the poem together. I was very young, and common sense told me not to give my word. I could easily say, I'll give it some thought. What's the big hurry? It's not a train schedule. I'll give my word after graduation, after military service, after I make a home. But time exploded. There was no before. There was no after. In the blinding present, you had to choose. So I gave my word. A word. A noose around my neck, an ultimate word. In the rare moments when everything is light and becomes transparent, I think to myself, my word, how I'd like to take my word back. It doesn't last for long. The world's axis screeches. People pass away, as do landscapes, colored rings of time. But the word I gave is stuck in my throat. Now let's analyze the poem line by line. The speaker begins, I was very young. The poem is told in a first person point of view, and we know this because of the use of the word, or rather letter, I. I imagine the speaker as being someone who is considerably older, and I say that because of the tense of the verb. The speaker says, I was very young was, of course, being past tense. The speaker does not say, I am, which would be present tense, very young. And common sense told me not to give my word. In other words, common sense at the point in time that the speaker is referencing when he or she was very young told them at that point not to give their word. Now, this phrase is important, we know, at least in part, because it is mentioned in the title of the poem. But generally, this phrase in our parlance means or represents making a promise or a commitment. When someone says that they give you their word, that means that they are promising to fulfill whatever it is that they say they are going to do. Carrying on in the second stanza, the speaker says, I could easily say, I'll give it some thought. Now, what the speaker is referencing here is, of course, giving their word, making a promise or commitment. And what's important to consider here is the tone of the speaker. I would identify their tone as being very blasé or indifferent. And that fits with what's being communicated here in the speaker's relationship to time. I would describe them as thinking that they could procrastinate in making a promise or a commitment. I could easily say, I'll give it some thought. Why? They have plenty of time to do so. They are very young. And here, this is the most kind of glib statement. What's the big hurry? What's the rush? I'm very young. It's not a train schedule, which is to say that there's not an exact point in time when I have to make a promise or a commitment. This inclination to procrastinate on the part of the speaker when they were very young is made most clear in the third stanza, when the speaker says explicitly, I'll give my word after graduation, after military service, after I make a home. The speaker, in other words, will give their word, they'll make a promise or a commitment, and the exact nature of that promise or commitment is not revealed. I think it is left intentionally vague so that it represents any promise or commitment, but they'll make that promise or commitment after these different landmarks in their life. After graduating from high school or college, presumably, after serving out their military service, 
after becoming married and having children, making, in other words, a home. The point the speaker is making here is that you can put off making a decision, a promise or commitment at any point in the future. And that just demonstrates the naivete on the part of the speaker when they were very young because they didn't understand the relationship between themselves and the development of their life and time. Nonetheless, in the fourth stanza, the speaker reveals that there has been some event that is so pressing that they feel the onus to make a choice, promise, or commitment. The speaker says, but time exploded. There was no before, there was no after. Time exploded, I would liken to a bomb exploding. And if we were analyzing this poem from a biographical perspective, this would be apt. We know that Zbigniew Herbert took part in the Polish resistance during World War II. He fought against both the Soviets and the Nazis, who were both working to conquer the territory of Poland. And we could easily imagine that an event like this, a world war that is all pervasive and affects so many people, ripples out into the lives of just about everyone who exists that that would be the kind of event that would force the speaker to make a choice, promise, or commitment. And in fact, this world event was so sudden that it's likened to an explosion. And in that suddenness, it's a blinding present. You don't know where to look. There's no before. There's no after. You don't know where to look. Your relationship to time is disorienting. But the speaker felt that that moment they had to make a choice, and they did. They gave their word. They made a promise or a commitment. In the fifth stanza, the speaker's attitude towards giving their word has changed drastically from being blasé to being grave. Recall in the second stanza when the speaker says, what's the big hurry? In other words, what's the rush? I am very young. Why do I need to make a choice, promise, or commitment now? It's not a train schedule. There's not a particular point in time when I need to do that. Here, the speaker says, a word, a noose round my neck. Now, this is a metaphor. It's an implicit comparison between giving your word, making a choice, promise, or commitment on the one hand, and a noose around your neck, an object of death. Now, you might wonder, in what sense are these similar? And it's this, that making a choice, promise, or commitment is a lethal act. You, as an individual at any point in time, have a series of possibilities strewn before you which are like paths. To walk down one path, to choose, make a promise, commitment, to choose one path is to kill off that part of yourself you would have been if you walked down another path. Thus, making a choice, promise, or commitment is murdering a part of yourself, in a sense. And this is why the speaker says that a word, a noose around your neck, is an ultimate word. There's something irrevocable about it. In the sixth stanza, the speaker's tone changes once again. It's gone from being blasé to grave, and now it's more mournful or regretful. The speaker says, in the rare moments when everything is light and becomes transparent. In other words, in those small instances when the speaker feels like they understand themselves and the world, they think to themselves this, my word, how I'd like to take my word back, which is quite obviously saying, I wish I could take away the choice, promise, or commitment that I made. But once again, you can't because your word is ultimate. It's irrevocable, as was referenced in the previous stanza. In the seventh stanza, the speaker says, it doesn't last for long. In other words, this sense of regret that I feel for giving my word. It doesn't last for long because time continues to pass. And this is first hinted at here with this image. The world screeching on its axis, which brings to mind most clearly a train, for example, leaving a train station. You have the idea of the world, the globe, the earth, turning and turning on its rails like a train would and screeching as it does so. But it's an image of time passing. And we have a few more 
of similar images in the final stanza. The speaker says, People pass away, as do landscapes, colored rings of time. People pass away, people die, and so do landscapes. When you think about this technically, geological features like a mountain, hill, or a bluff erode over time from the weather. Colored rings of time seems to me to be a reference to the inner rings of a tree that mark the years of its existence. Despite all these images, despite all these things showing that time is passing by, the speaker draws a contrast through the use of the conjunction but. But the word I gave is stuck in my throat. Despite time passing, what remains is what I said I would do the promise, choice, or commitment I made. And it ends here on a very good note because the word is stuck in his throat and it almost makes the speaker speechless, which is exactly where the poem should end with nothing else being able to be said. What does this poem say thematically? In my opinion, it speaks to a universal human experience. When we are young, we do not understand the relationship between ourselves and time, or rather, the way that we are subjected to time. We believe that we are invincible, that we are going to live for eternity. And as a consequence, we don't put the proper weight on choices, decisions, and promises that we should. But as we grow older and we see the people around us grow sick and die, when we become aware of the ravages of the world, we understand that we are finite creatures like everyone else. And that realization puts on us the onus to take our decisions, promises, and commitments more seriously. And what I've always taken from this poem is that sense of integrity. It's made me more and more conscious of any time I speak and say I'm going to do something, then I should strive as much as possible to fulfill that because I only have so much time to do so. I am a mortal creature like anyone else. And at the end of the day, I will be what it is that I do. The promises, commitments, and choices I fulfill. I'll go ahead and leave it there. Tell me what you guys thought about my analysis down in the comments below. Tell me what you think about this poem, what your opinion is about it. And if you enjoyed this content, hit that like button, smash subscribe, hit the notification bell so you can be informed when I drop more videos on poetry and prejudice. Until next time, guys.